Hello, and welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I'm Liz Cavell, Associate Counsel here at FFRF. Today we are going to talk to the YouTube star known as the Genetically Modified Skeptic. His name is Drew McCoy. And specifically, we're going to talk about a topic Drew covered on his show that turned out to be surprisingly controversial. Is there really such a thing as atheist culture? And if so, what is atheist culture? As always, we want to hear what you're thinking about the subject, so you can leave your questions in the Facebook comments below, or you can email them to askanatheist at ffrf.org. I'm joined today by FFRF's IT director, Scott Nickelbein. Hi, Scott, hello. Hi, Hi. You actually brought the genetically modified skeptic to our attention, Scott. So tell us a little bit about how you found him. Well, I've been watching Drew's uh, uh, broadcast, his YouTube channels for years, and uh, I've always been very impressed by his kind of commitment to honesty and also intellect, intellectual rigor when, um, you know, it, discussing things like religion and spirituality and some of these other topics. So a few uh, weeks ago, he did an episode of uh, his podcast where, or his, his uh, YouTube uh, channel where he talked about uh, atheist culture and uh, it covered everything from new atheist authors like uh, Christopher Hitchens to atheist organizations like us to common atheist experiences and even common atheist memes. So here's a clip from his segment on atheist comedians. Atheist comedians, George Carlin. Carlin died in 2008, but his legacy is still influential enough today to earn a spot on this list easily. He's a legendary comedian, author, and actor who very often mocked those in power in his work. Politicians and clergy were regular targets of his wit. Among atheists, he might be best known for a particular comedy routine of his, which is floating around on YouTube right now, titled, Religion is Bullshit. I can't even count the number of times I've heard other atheists in real life imitate Carlin's punchline, but he loves you. And the Invisible Man has a special list of 10 things he does not want you to do. And if you do any of these 10 things, he has a special place full of fire and smoke and burning and torture and anguish where he will send you to live and suffer and burn and choke and scream and cry forever and ever till the end of time. But he loves you. <laughs> Drew, lives, uh, Drew lives in Texas with his wife, Taylor who makes a quick appearance in, in this video and is a YouTuber in her own right. Drew, welcome to Ask an Atheist. Hey guys, I am very honored to be here. I have been a longtime supporter of FFRF and uh, that's one of the many reasons I included it in the Atheist Culture video. But yeah, thanks for having me on. Thanks so much, Drew. And let's start with the obvious question and jump right in. What is Atheist Culture? Atheist culture is, like any other culture, a product of a group of people who have some shared ideas and identities. Really, that's, that's what culture is. Uh, and as I'm sure we'll get into, it is somewhat contentious that atheists can create culture because it's somewhat contentious that atheists share a common identity, not just one singular position. But the inevitable product of humans getting together is basically what culture is. Right. And obviously, we'll talk about why this was so controversial, but of course, like, it's a characteristic of culture, no matter what group's culture you're talking about, that, um, you know, there's no monolithic thing about any group of people with one shared common characteristic. But of course, that doesn't mean that um, people that share that characteristic don't also share cultural components. But what are some of the examples of atheist culture for those that didn't see your video um, that you covered? Uh, one that I like to point out is scientific skepticism. You yeah. know, there obviously this is something that touches 
other bits of culture. Um, even even tabletop gaming culture gets into some scientific skepticism <laughs> stuff sometimes. But yeah, scientific skepticism, this idea that I, I think was especially canonized by people like Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson, that it's important to measure our beliefs and ideas by what the scientific process can tell us. That doesn't mean that we follow this dogmatically. It just means that we use some of these in order to refine our own ideas and remain skeptical of bad, dubious claims. Uh, I think that that, I bring that up because I think just about anybody watching this show would be, would be like, well, yeah, I that, that's just a given. I don't even think of that as a part of culture. It's just, of course I do that. It's so, it's so, so much just a given. Uh, but also we have public figures, common figures like, you know, George Carlin or Dan Barker, or even the two of you, we have shows that we like to watch in common, like mine, like yours. And uh, when when getting comments, you know, where people are saying, well, I don't really think I engage in atheist culture. I've watched plenty of your videos and I never got the impression <laughs> that you held me to that. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's not something that everybody wants to necessarily acknowledge, but I think that that may even be um, an indicator that atheist culture seems to be such a given for many people that they they wouldn't think of it. It, it, it almost reinforces the conclusion I, I, I try to draw in the video. I uh, actually, I posted something this morning on uh, this episode on the uh, atheism uh, uh, section of uh, Reddit. And uh, one of the responses I got was, you're soaking in it, which, uh, you know, uh, an old Palm Olive TV ad reference, but nevertheless, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's a, an exemplar of, of how we are actually so imbued with some of these things, some of these media uh, things that uh, that we're not even noticing that that's that's a part of our experience. But even in even raising the subject of atheist culture, you received a surprising amount of pushback, um, even vitriol from other atheists, saying things like, take a shower, or it isn't 2010 anymore, grow up. Uh, why do you think the very question prompted such a strong reaction? First of all, I'll say, unfortunately, it wasn't very surprising that I got responses <laughs> like that, and, and kinder bits of pushback too. Take a shower, yeah, I, I can admit, I got comments like that. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that, so the, the, the thing that I discuss at the end of the video is that atheists are often accused of being dogmatic like religious people. We're compared to religious people. And of course, to us, it's very important that we are not religious people. You know, we don't, we don't believe in those things. We're not religious. We don't have dogmas in the same way. We don't have holy texts. We are separate from that. And that's important to us, especially us who actively fight for our rights to be protected. You know, FFRF is, is one of the groups where I think that's embodied the most. And saying that atheism or atheists have a shared culture is to some people in some people's minds like saying we are, in fact, like religious people. We do have these things in common. We do have texts and figures and ideas and symbols that we share in common. When we're so constantly accused of being dogmatic and just compared to religious fundamentalists, I think that we try to overcorrect sometimes and say, you know, no, we don't have a culture. We we are not like that in any way. And we are, we are almost beyond being like any other human we're we don't <laughs> fall into those just simple human traps like having shared ideas but the reality is that we are like anyone else ultimately we are just as fallible we're just as creative we're just as connected to our communities as anybody else and that means that we're going to share culture and i try to hammer home the idea that this is not a bad thing. This is not a negative of atheism or atheist culture that, you know, it exists. I, I actually think it's a very positive thing that atheists are able to have a culture without always having the same level of 
dogma that other cultures may have. Do you think that some of this, the accusation or even the uh, suspicion of an accusation that atheism is like just another religion comes from an, sort of an inability to distinguish between what actually constitutes a religion and what constitutes a tribe or a group. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously, at least many atheists would see themselves as part of the atheist community. And just by doing that, uh, you know, you, you buy into a certain amount of culture. But, uh, but there's, there's a difference between communities or tribes or however you want to put it and religion, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. Now, religion is a form of a tribe. You know, a, a tribe, a community, a group is this category up here. And then you have a lot of different subcategories. And people like to, you know, say cult is one kind of category. Religion is one kind of category. A, you know, a community or a club is a different kind of category, that kind of thing. But some, something that I try to do on my channel is help my viewers distinguish between um, these types of categories by increasing religious literacy. A lot of people who like to watch videos like mine are people who are more freshly out of religion. And in religious circles, you're actually a lot of the time less likely to be well educated in, in religion. You're going to be less religiously literate a lot of the time. You're just going to know group in group claims, not general reliable information about religion. And so a lot of my viewers actually are coming from that perspective as well. They know what their former evangelical or fundamentalist tribe claimed about religion but not much else. And so when they see a video like mine, I, I think they, they go, whoa, 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 you're, you're saying that we're part of a tribe? That means that we're part of a, a religion or a, a cult and, and, get, and get scared. But it's, it's very complicated. When you read actual scholarship in the field of religious studies, you see that what a tribe is versus what a religion is versus what a cult is, these things, they're actually really complicated philosophical and sociological questions that can't be just hand waved away by saying you calling it that makes me uncomfortable. So I, I try to engage with empathy on my channel because I realize a lot of people are not coming from the most informed perspective when they're watching videos about religion, even if they're watching atheist videos about religion. Mm -hmm. Right. I think you're hitting on um, something else that I've been thinking about as we're having this conversation, which is just even the the word culture is such a um, complex kind of idea that doesn't just neatly um, conjure up the same ideas for individual people, right? So it's just one of those words that I think um, is an obstacle to people feeling like they can um, let down their guard. So um, in other words, uh, atheists, I think in general, just as a middle-aged atheist who's been around for a while, like I know a lot of other non-theists and you know other identifying non-believers. And I think one shared characteristic, um, not by every single individual atheist, but by many, is that they're a group of people who are sort of like very aggressively non-joining, non-grouping um, type of people. And that's not to say that they don't or we don't value community, but that one of the things that we really agitate against is the idea that, you know, we're going to join some in-group. Um, and talking about shared culture, I think, is something that kind of triggers that idea of you're joining something, um, you're being put into a group. Um, and that's, I think, ironically <laughs> or funnily, something that um, is also a shared characteristic, which is um, just sort of like the, the agitating against the idea that we would be um, in group joining. But I mean, just like any other group, um, and what makes this a group is just this one shared characteristic, right? There's many other things that we don't share as individuals and and not every single person who shares, you know, the identity of atheist is going to share all of these things in your video, but they're just common um, elements that 
you can sort of uh, think about and talk about and identify as kind of common things that we all tend towards, right? We all tend to be skeptics. We all tend to be science-minded. Um, we all tend to be interested in the separation of church and state. And, um, you know, we tend to find George Carlin funny and all of these other things, right? It doesn't mean every single one of us uh, has to love George Carlin, but it's just talking about and identifying these things that we share um, when we all share this one other thing, which is our atheism. And that's all it is. And that's okay. Yeah, absolutely fantastic points. I'm really glad that you brought up the idea that the fact that we don't want to be a part of a group, the, the fact that we want to be perceived as being fiercely independent, maybe we are fiercely independent more so than, than other groups statistically or something. But the fact that we almost have this slight antisocial <laughs> uh, characteristic that we tend to view as a very positive thing. I, I think it can be a very positive thing. Uh, that's important to our identity. And like I've discussed in other videos about atheist identity, when you are immersed in <laughs> and submerged in a culture that is so passionate and even forceful about being a specific thing, not being that specific thing is just as a defining of a characteristic as being that thing. You know, it, you actually stand out as a part of a group even more if you say, I'm not part of the religious group. I'm not part of the Christian group in the US. And, and so I, I think that especially in this pressure cooker that we're in, we are more likely to join together and seek out community and, and that kind of thing because we are not joiners. And again, that's not a negative thing. It does not negate the fact that we try to think independently and that we think that not allowing social influence to influence us unduly, you know, it, it, it's not a bad, it's not a bad thing to try to be validated by your social group. It's not a bad thing to join communities. It is just a human thing to be a part of that. It's a healthy thing. And that can coexist with trying your best to think independently and critically. Right on. Well, one of the elements of atheist culture that you discuss in your video is the deconversion story. Um, and I just wanted to ask you why, to you, this is such a central element in atheism. And can you share a little bit about your own deconversion story? Yeah. I mean, a huge part of culture is just having common experiences, especially if they are particularly influential on your core values and ideas, and especially when they are emotionally intense. You know, when you when you join a religious community, especially in kind of more charismatic religious communities, you get up there and there's music playing and you testify. You say how the Lord brought you into <laughs> this. And, and you know, it, it really bonds you together with, with other people. And in atheist culture, I do think that we have a version of that, which is sharing, hey, I was raised this way, or maybe I wasn't raised this way. And eventually I came to be the person that I am now. And again, in the pressure cooker of the religious US, uh, it can be a very emotionally and psychologically intense experience. So of course, like any other person, we would want to share these formative experiences with each other and they would inevitably bond us together. Now, the deconversion story that I have is one that I've shared a ton on my YouTube channel and I could argue that it might be the number one thing that gets people to watch me is because they relate to my deconversion story. They relate to me, which I think I think proves my point, but uh, I'll go on. Yeah, I was I was raised um, independent fundamental Baptist. I was a young earth creationist. I like people like Ken Ham and Kent Hovind, that kind of thing. I wasn't even on the William Lane Craig level, uh, <laughs> which which is not that high to begin with. Uh, and eventually, after going to Christian college and becoming scientifically literate through getting my psychology degree undergrad and then doing some master's work, I, I realized that supernaturalistic experiences, which I was taught to trust, actually had pretty valid psychological explanations. Uh, I, I couldn't accept anecdotal evidence. I, 
began reading the Bible even more than I did when I was a kid, which was a lot, actually, more so than just about anybody else I know. And I, I realized that, you know, there are pretty good psychological explanations for witnessing things that people would say are miracles. And in, and in ancient cultures where you didn't have access to this kind of explanatory uh, power in, in psychology, then you might think something is is magical or demonic or supernatural. And so it, it became pretty apparent to me that I think it's more likely that these things have naturalistic explanations than all of the magic I was taught was real actually is. And coming out of a religious fundamentalist family as the not only the first atheist ever in my family's history that that I know of, <laughs> Um, but also the first in four generations of men in my family not to be an evangelical missionary, a fundamentalist evangelical missionary on the mission field. That, that was an experience for me. And I needed community. Uh, how, how am I expected to go through this alone? I already lost some friends and family because of it. I had people from the former mission basically hunting me electronically. <laughs> and, uh, so of course I had to find community and I was able to do that through my YouTube channel and then finally in person. And now my all of my best friends are people that I met through atheist spaces. And not all of them are still involved in that. It's not about that they are atheists that I that I love them. It's just that we we have had similar enough experiences to where it was very easy for us to bond. So one word that doesn't come up in your video is deconstruction. Uh, which is a term that I've heard quite a bit on uh, social, certainly on social media, and uh, primarily from ex-evangelicals and or ex-Mormons. So, what's the difference for my own benefit? What's the difference between deconstruction and deconversion? And who do you think is most likely to describe themselves as having deconstructed their faith? Mm. Yeah, great questions. I really, I feel like I really should make a, a whole explainer video on this because it's something I, I like to think about. I think that while people will say that the primary difference between deconstruction and deconversion is uh, the, the end point, you know, deconversion implies that you left the religion completely. And deconstruction means that you are untangling certain ideas from your identity, you're unlearning certain things that you were indoctrinated with, et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't mean that you necessarily leave. Sometimes it does mean that you leave the faith. Sometimes it doesn't. That's a valid distinction, absolutely. But I actually think that the cultural identity between, the, the, the distinction between deconstruction and deconversion is probably the most important factor. So deconversion is a word that might have been entirely invented by atheists in atheist spaces. We are the ones that say this, you know, and, and even um, it, it's even a a Christian kind of a, a white ex-Christian atheist thing that, that we say. Now, you're not going to see ex-Muslims say they deconverted mm -hmm. as often as you're going to see ex-Christians say that they deconverted. I think it is a, a kind of cultural idea, whereas deconstruction is something that involves a lot of people who still call themselves Christian. They're also a lot more ethnically and uh, sexually diverse. Deconversion is something that, yes, you will see women talking about online, but you will primarily hear about deconversion from atheist men. And most popular atheist men creators are also white. So white atheist men creators is basically what you're going to hear deconversion from. And whereas deconstruction, you're going to hear this a lot from uh, queer communities, communities of color. Uh, you're going to see this a lot, a lot more from women. If you go on TikTok and you go to deconstruction TikTok, it's going to be mostly women and queer people who are talking about this. You will not see the same thing if you're looking for deconversion, especially on YouTube. I think that's the biggest distinction, but I'm sure there's plenty more that people can sound off in, in the comments about. But to me, I think that that's really the biggest difference. So there's not only atheist culture, there's atheist subculture. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, there there absolutely is. There absolutely is. And that is one of the, the main comments that I actually got as kind of a constructive bit of criticism on my video that, hey, this is not really atheist culture. This is atheist subculture, specifically 
in the US. It, it especially is talking about white men who have a college education. And I think that's, I think that's a valid um, piece of insight that a lot of this culture really does come from a kind of narrow uh, demographic. And it doesn't mean that other people aren't included in it. It's just that atheist spaces for a long time have been dominated by this guy, right? <laughs> and not, not so much other, other people. So as much as you cover in your video, and it's very encyclopedic, there are invariable, of course, invariably things that you had to leave out. Uh, so for instance, you, you reference Russell's teapot, but nothing specifically on Bertram Russell. Uh, he, you do the Darwin fish, but not Charles Darwin. Uh, a fact that, in fact, a lot of your references don't seem to go back much further than, say, the 1980s. Is this because older atheist ideas and figures aren't very well represented on things like YouTube and social media in general? Or do you think it's just not as relevant or recognizable to your audience? I think it's more the latter. Uh, people like Bertrand Russell are extremely influential today. They're, they're definitely still influential through the people that I talked about, through the symbols and ideas that I talked about. They're, a lot of them have their very foundations in people that were, were speaking in the earlier 20th century and before, people like David Hume. If we didn't have David Hume, we probably wouldn't have scientific skepticism. But yes, I don't think those things are as recognizable to most people. You know, people will talk about scientific skepticism, but not necessarily know that Hume's ideas about miracles very much influenced people like Carl Sagan, and that Carl Sagan actually even talked about that. Uh, so that was one of the reasons why I decided to leave those things out, is because I wanted to hit on things that are very recognizable to a very specific generation of atheists, whose identities are also grounded in calling themselves atheists in a way. So someone like Carl Sagan is very important to someone like me, and I'm, I'm assuming you two who would call yourselves atheists, but, man, how, how, do I, how do I explain this? Carl Sagan himself was, was just as enthusiastic about all the ideas that we like that Sagan said, but he didn't call himself an atheist, mm -hmm. and I don't think it was important for him to call himself an atheist. He, he did not see that as being important. And so really what I was trying to do was describe the recognizable and core ideas and elements for people who identify actively as atheists, not just people who have been influenced by things that also influence atheist culture in a big way. That makes sense. Um, speaking about Darwin, obviously there's an overlap between atheists and things, you know, in atheist culture, atheist concerns, um, and the acceptance of evolution. You pointed out that um, some of the scientists on your list, and you just mentioned this with Carl Sagan, but you mentioned Bill Nye and Neil deGrasse Tyson, don't explicitly identify as atheists, but obviously they publicly campaign for the teaching of evolution. It's a battleground issue in atheism, but especially in state church separation and public education. We have a life-size statue of Charles Darwin. Uh, it's actually a wax model in our atheist library here. Um, right across the yep, hall. Right across the hall um, in Free Thought Hall. So I just wanted you to talk a little bit about um, how you see that connection between atheist culture and evolution and evolution acceptance. Yeah, yeah I mean, so the absolute legend, Seth Andrews, the, the podcaster, YouTuber, author, speaker, just, just one of my absolute heroes. He, he has talked about this subject. Um, and I, I really appreciated his cultural insights. And, and one of those is that atheism is a culture. Yes, but it is also well described as a reaction to another culture. And this is something that we have touched on here. Um, I think that the reason why talking about evolution is so important in atheist culture is because <laughs> pushing creationism, even at the expense of proper education, uh, even at the expense of people's actual equal rights, um, a right to it, to a good education, 
uh, an equal representation of, of other religious people. That's something that's really important to a very powerful minority, actually, in, in the U.S. And so atheist culture, I think, reacts to the fact that we have so many people in power like the, you know, the not so much the former president, but the former vice president and, and the speaker of the house today that would say, yes, you know, creationism should be taught in schools. Evolution is just a theory, Mr. Senator, you know, that that kind of thing. And uh, it becomes important to us to take that on, not just because we care so much about evolution being true. It has to do with, and you guys know better than anybody else, that it has to do with sticking up for people's ability to get a good education and to have religious institutions represented in an equitable way in the public sphere, in the public sphere, not in public schools, in places that are outside of, you know, government funded, taxpayer funded institutions. And so, yes, while a lot of people like myself learned about evolution and that influenced our uh, eventual coming out of religion. I, I don't think a lot of us are really trying to educate people about evolution because we're just like, oh, it's so cool. Mm -hmm. It is cool, but it's not really that. We, we are trying to keep, keep people from being miseducated and people being misrepresented. That's what it's really about, I think. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, one more thing I wanted to uh, mention from your video was the segment on atheist magicians, um, James Randi, Penn Jillette, you cover. Let's look at a clip. Atheist magicians. The late James Randi was a magician who made a career challenging psychics to prove their powers in controlled environments right up on stage where they always embarrass themselves. This was called the $1 million paranormal challenge. And yeah, of course, no psychic ever actually won because James Randi was able to debunk every single attempt. He was very well known for exposing the tricks of faith healers as well, particularly Peter Popoff. I suspected that Popoff's revelations were other than divine. The radio scanner we brought to the hall picked up a decidedly worldly source. Popoff was being prompted by his wife through a wireless earpiece. <laughs> so um, I just like this. I think it's interesting. Um, but what do you think it is about stage magic that has turned so many of its practitioners into crusading skeptics? Uh, I think when you see how the sausage is made, it changes you, you know, <laughs> you know? Yeah. there, there, there are plenty of people, you know, have talked about this and I've even heard people at FFRF conferences talk about this, where when, when you really get behind a production like that, when you, when you understand and are even skilled at influencing public perception, skilled at pulling off illusions, you realize how much is an illusion out there how much is marketing how much is smoke and mirrors how much is just straight up trickery or dishonesty and and there are people who while they really enjoy creating illusion and steering perception and just entertaining they also have strong moral character and strong scientific skepticism you know critical thinking skills and they want to spread that they want to show people hey this is great and fun and entertaining but when you take it past entertainment and fun and fantasy, it can actually be extremely damaging on your wallet. It can be extremely damaging on culture. It can even do things like start wars. It, it can be that bad. And so you have people like James Randi and, uh, you know, Penn Jillette, Penn and Teller, they're uh, perform performing at PsyCon like constantly, just about every year in Vegas. <laughs> um, that they they really want to show you what's in front of and behind the curtain simultaneously. And not to everyone, but I think a huge number of their fans, I mean, these guys were very successful entertainers in their own right. They really value the the honesty and the showmanship simultaneously. I, I think that it actually teaches a pretty valuable moral lesson to our culture that you know, that these guys can get up there and go, hey, this is entertaining, but also look at everything that's behind this. It's important to recognize it. I think uh, one of the primal examples of that, of the, of the uh, skeptical magician, was Harry Houdini, who uh, spent so much of his, I don't know that he, uh, to my knowledge, he never uh, 
he never identified as an atheist, but he certainly took on spiritualism uh, very aggressively and uh, was doing the same things that I believe James Randi is, has actually cited Houdini as a uh, as a sort of a, a hero or as, as an inspiration for uh, for what he did. Yeah, I think it's it's one of those age old things that we can all relate to, even though so few of us are magicians. Where it's like this thing that you love so much that is a craft that you've worked so hard to be good at. Um, and if that thing is is creating illusion for entertainment or for showmanship, um, it's really painful to see someone turn that to exploitation. Um, you know, the pop off video. It's like seeing someone take the thing that you love and that's your craft um, and turn it to this, you know, nefarious use or, you know, turn it to. Um, take people's money or to, you know, exploit and manipulate people is just like infuriating. And so um, you're the one that knows best of all how to kind of, you know, unearth that. And it's also just really fun to see, right? Seeing the best at the craft, um, really just pulling the veil on, um, you know, supernatural practitioners is the best. Absolutely. And I actually feel this in my own way as a content creator, you know, when you have editing and effects and all these things at your disposal, you really are creating illusion as someone on social media. And we have a, a pretty severe crisis at this point of people creating illusions now with things like AI tools and, and just inventing conspiracy theories because they sell really well. And of course, you know, as someone who's made a, a career at this point for like actually the better part of a decade now on, on social media, of course I know how to make that stuff too. I know how to make that sausage. I just know that the sausage is poison. <laughs> and uh, it's important to me to, to give people content that is not only informative, but also very transparent and um, vulnerable in a way, able to be held accountable. So this is why I, I try to cite my my sources as much as possible and admit my own weaknesses and and things like that, even at the expense of my own bottom line. You know, I could get a lot more views if I just rage baited people. But I I think people like James Randi have inspired me too much to to go, okay, I gotta do the best to to put on my showmanship without actually compromising my own values. Right. All right, let's turn now to some audience questions. We've got um, questions from Facebook and some questions that were submitted before we even started the show. So, <clears throat> is culture, do you think, Drew, is culture something that's predefined or is it something that is simply observed and described? Ooh, that's that's a really good question and a really, really difficult one. Mm -hmm. I think you could make the argument either way. However, I lean more toward the idea that culture is something that is better to be described. It is descriptive, not prescriptive. Uh, you can be a part of atheist culture by calling yourself an atheist and just liking my videos, which is every single person who disagreed with the idea <laughs> in my comment section <laughs> that, you know, that atheist culture exists, of course. And I also think that it's important not to to gatekeep uh, these communities. I, I think that it's really rather arbitrary to say, well, I have 15 of these shared values with everybody else and you only have five. So <laughs> I'm really more of a true atheist than you. We we don't accept that when it comes to defining something like Christianity, for example, progressive Christians and fundamentalist Christians are both Christians and they have a lot more than 15 differences. So I. I tend to go toward let's describe culture as a product of human beings and of human minds than to say that culture is something that we should prescribe identity to human minds based upon. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think that's important for sort of trying to untangle what's sort of good and what's bad about culture, right? Because um, as a woman in like atheism and secularism, it's there there can be elements of that you could describe as atheist culture that are toxic and bad and that we um, that we don't want. You know, these aren't the these aren't all the cool best things that we've curated and that we're presenting to the world. These are just sort of 
um, things we're observing that have come out of this group identity. And of course, that changes and evolves over time. Those are things that we can reject and work to push out of our culture. Um, and there are things that um, we can strive to bring into or make a part of our culture that haven't sort of simply materialized um, on their own. So it's sort of this mix of both, but I do think it's important to understand like our agency in the process of uh, our own culture. Absolutely. And I mean, I, I included some things in there that I uh, that I said in the very video that I don't actually like. I don't really like using the word sky daddy. I I'm, I'm actually as a biologist, I love Richard Dawkins. But as someone as a social commentator, which is primarily what he does now, I'm very much against what he's saying. I I think that he spreads actually a lot of pseudoscience about transgender issues, which is very harmful in both his country and mine. And uh, they're they're there are transgender people who have supported and worked with FFRF, and I'm have been so excited to see that the kind of acceptance and rationality in in FFRF of working with and supporting trans people, and and just to see someone that is so important to atheist culture, you know, doing something like that, it it sucks to see, but it doesn't mean that Richard Dawkins is not a part of atheist culture because he just undeniably is. He's been too influential, regardless of whether or not I like that or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. And and just being able to, to talk about culture, though, in a way that sort of understands and makes room for sort of all of these um, ideas about what culture is and how it and how it comes to be. Right. Like you can't deny that Richard Dawkins has influenced whatever we, you might think of as atheist culture. But you also can, as a member of a group of people that identify as atheists, say, well, but also, um, I'd like to change atheist culture to really reject ideas like what Richard Dawkins, you know, puts out on social media all the time now. And, and like, I have agency in the process of how, what our culture becomes and how it grows and develops. Absolutely. Um, so here's a question um, just for you specifically. You've probably talked about this on your channel, but tell us here. For those of us who do not know, what is the origin of the genetically modified skeptic name? Yeah, it has a couple of origins. One I kind of hit on actually earlier in, in our conversation, and that is I'm the first in four generations of men in my family not to be a missionary. <laughs> um, being a missionary, an evangelical missionary, is absolutely in my very genetic code but I did not become that. And you can argue, sure, that I'm a different kind of missionary. I I have a different kind of mission, and, and that's fine. I don't, I don't find that to be an insulting comparison. Uh, but it, it does seem that there's something that must have changed within me as the, this fourth generation or fifth generation, not to, you know, not to be a missionary. Uh, the other is when I started my channel, it was really meant more to talk about alternative medicine and debunk alternative medicine pseudoscientific claims. Uh, my my family has been very much involved in peddling that as as well as peddling Christianity. And those things tend to go hand in hand now. And uh, a a a swear word, a bad word, a four letter word within alternative medicine spaces and just pseudoscience spaces is genetically modified organisms. <laughs> So by calling myself like the genetically modified skeptic, that means I'm just absolutely the worst of the worst. I'm, the hor <laughs> I'm, I'm such a horrible guy. It's almost like calling yourself a Satanist in a way uh, to, to them. And I, I just thought it was funny and it had two meanings. And I, I tend to like names that have multiple layers to them. So that was a that was a fun name for me to pick. Right. So it doesn't have anything to do with. Um, a meme I recently saw of you in which you had enormous eyes. Yeah, uh, I, I've had some people make edits of me that make me look like I've been genetically modified. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's that's fair enough. But but that is a product of the name, not the reason the name exists. Um, all right. I'll ask you this question and see where it goes. Um, so you've gotten a lot of backlash on your video about atheist culture. Do you think that is sort of evidence of the fact that the atheist community as a whole is divided? Um, and if so, do you think there are ways to ease that division and work closer? Or do you think it's something else? 
I, I think that you actually hit on a really good point earlier, and that is that we like to we like to think of ourselves as fiercely independent and as splitters rather than joiners. And I think that that's true. That doesn't mean that the atheist community is necessarily best described as incredibly fractured or divided. Uh, I think that we, within the context of the U.S. especially, people who are willing to say, no, I don't, I don't go by that, I will not stand by this, I am going to split, I'm going to make my own community, or I'm going to speak up and criticize that, we, we those types of people, which is probably all three of us, uh, are, are the types of people who are selected for in atheist communities. And so we just have this predisposition, I think, to fracture more easily, to be more atomized, um, to be more ready to debate, even be hot tempered at certain times, depending on how important the issue is. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I don't think it necessarily means that atheist groups will always be inferior or something like that to groups that are full of just joiners because we, we have strengths. Like I actually think FFRF might be the best example of this. Uh, FFRF basically professionally dissents by saying extremely unpopular things that are actually really, really good for everyone involved, regardless of how unpopular they might be. And I don't think that we would see a group of joiners rather than splitters doing the advocacy that FFRF does. I just don't think that that would be possible. And, and so I think that us splitters have some advantages in, in groups of our own. The disadvantages may be that it's it can be much more difficult to mobilize really large groups of people. I mean, you know, Christian nationalist musician who's honestly not even very talented at any part of what he's doing, Sean Foyt, can get triple, quadruple, 10 times the audience that FFRF can get at one of their conferences. And he can get that at a state capitol building in Iowa or even somewhere that's not as religious, like, I don't know, Nevada. And uh, so that's that's a disadvantage that we have, but it doesn't come without it, its own advantages. That might be a good place to stop. Mm -hmm. Drew, I want to thank you so much for joining us. This has been such a great conversation, hopefully the first of many. Um, and that concludes Ask an Atheist for this week. Don't forget, we also have a weekly broadcast TV show, Free Thought Matters. This week, Annie Laurie Gaylor has a talk with the liberal redneck himself, Trey Crowder. He is so funny. Here's a short clip from his Netflix comedy special called Damn Boy, where he reveals how he met his wife. Because we met working at a bar together in Cookville, Tennessee, just up the road here. Yeah, a absolutely. Noted stronghold of enlightenment, Cookville, Tennessee. <laughs> and one day early on, I overheard her talking to another server about that girl's roommate who wrecked her car. And the girl was totally fine, but it f***ed her car up. She got a DUI situation. And the other server was saying, yeah, it's just... It's terrible, you know, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray for her. And my future wife, without missing a beat, goes, that's crazy, I too am gonna do nothing at all to actually help. <laughs> oh my God. Have my devil babies, you godless snowflake. You can see Free Thought Matters on TV stations all across the US, also on FFRF's Facebook and YouTube channels. And don't miss Free Thought Radio. This week, the show, uh, Annie Laurie and Dan will be talking with Stephen Emmert, Executive Director of the Secular Coalition for America. You can find Free Thought Radio at ffrf.org slash radio. And don't miss the latest episode of our We Dissent podcast. Me and FFRF's legal director, Rebecca Markert, join American atheists Allison Gill to discuss the 2024 state legislative cycle. Listen and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts or check us out online at we-dissent.org. If you want more information about the Freedom From Religion Foundation, check out our website at ffrf.org. If you remember already, thank you. If not, get over being a splitter and please join us. <laughs> Thank you so much, Drew, and we will see you next week on FFRF's Ask an Atheist.